Thank you, Olivia. Good morning. I have been teaching here uh, full-time for just shy of a year, uh, but I had been part-timing adjuncting for a long time, <laughs> like nine years or something. And about six years ago, I had a student who, when Olivia asked me to talk about guilt and shame, this one student just was vivid uh, in my mind. Uh, he was taking my Theology two class, and he would come into class every week, and you know how in cartoons, uh, sometimes a character's got a dark cloud following them everywhere, right, and it's just raining on them? Uh, this student seemed to have that dark cloud of shame. He couldn't make eye contact, he could hardly uh, get a coherent word out. You just looked at that guy and knew he was hiding something. And about four or five weeks into the semester, we're talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about how the Holy Spirit can kill sin in us that we can't kill for ourselves. And this student writes me a novel of an email divulging his decade-long battle with pornography addiction. Sends off the email and waits a week and doesn't hear from me. Waits another week, still no word back. Three weeks go by, and finally he pulls me aside after class and says, hey Thad, were you going to respond to that very bleeding heart, insanely vulnerable, open, honest confession of an email? Uh, what happened <laughs> was he sent it to thaddeuswilliams at gmail.com which was the email address I couldn't get because some other Thaddeus Williams had it. So mine is Thaddeus J. Williams at gmail.com. So this poor kid, uh, some other Thaddeus Williams in the world, opens up his email and reads about a novel of uh, a Biola student's pornography addiction. So I felt horrible for the kid. Like, talk about your all-time backfires, right? Confessing to completely the wrong person. And so... I said, drop the J in there, send the email back, and we'll go from there. So he finally gets it to me, and we met a, a day or two later. And I sat down, and he kind of gave me the laundry list of strategies that he had used over the years. You know, he had had these uh, pornography filters on his computer so that he would put in a passcode and turn his head so he wouldn't be able to, to crack the code. Um, and within a week, he would become like a world-class hacker and he managed to get around that passcode. Uh, he had done accountability groups. He had done everything and time and time again, uh, he found himself right back at square one, addicted to pornography. Well, I told him, I said, my first bit of advice was with all this guilt, with all this shame, the first thing you need to do is despair. And he looked at me like, that is just weird counsel. You want me to despair? I said, yes. I want you to dis despair of your own ability to make a single centimeter of progress against this sin in your own strength and in your own power. You've been trying it over a decade. Have you made an inch of progress? I said, the second thing we're going to do after you despair is we're going to pray like the God of the Bible actually exists. And we opened up to Romans 8, 13. And I shared with him these words. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And I pointed out to him, I said, those three words, by the Spirit, set biblical spirituality apart from every self-help system, every other religious worldview on the face of planet Earth, by the Spirit. Now let me just put the pause button on that student's story and we'll circle back to it, uh, just to illustrate the point. Let, let me ask, ask you guys a question. Some of you in my class will be able to guess this right away. Uh, take a guess, take a stab at how many cereal brands are in your typical supermarket aisle in your average American supermarket. Just throw out a number, how many different cereal brands are staring at you in your average anywhere USA supermarket cereal aisle. Throw out some numbers. 50? Did somebody say 200? You get massive extra credit. It's about 205 was the national average. 205, just 
that is mind blowing. If you stop to think about that, 205 different options are assailing you every time you enter your average American supermarket cereal aisle. Now that can feel kind of overwhelming, right? Like where do you even start with 205 options in front of you? Well, here's the secret to cereal shopping. If you were to turn all those 205 boxes on their side and look at the actual ingredients, you would find that 205 becomes about five. There's only like five ways that you can puff corn and infuse it with sugar, right? <laughs> And so the same thing we might feel like if you look at all the worldviews, if you look at all the religions, there's Mormonism, and then there's Islam, and then there's Sufi Islam, and Sunni Islam, and Shiite Islam, and then within Mormonism you have the reorganized LDS church, and then you have Jehovah's Witnesses, and then within Christianity you got all these denominations, there's Methodists, there's United Methodists, there's Presbyterian, there's Presbyterian Church America, Presbyterian Church USA, you got Baptists, you got Free Will Baptists, you got, and your head can just start spinning if you look at the cereal aisle of worldview options in front of us. But if you flip all of those boxes on their side, 205 options very quickly reduces to two. And in that passage I just read, you find the key ingredient of a biblical Christianity that you won't find in any other worldview, religion, or spiritual self-help system on the planet. It's those three words, those three ingredients, by the Spirit. You don't Deal with guilt by your own power. You don't deal with sin addictions by trying harder. Every other worldview box, you flip it on its side, you will find the ingredient of performance, of self-power, of try harder. Christianity and Christianity alone is the worldview with this crucial ingredient. It is the Holy Spirit's power by which we kill sin, not by you trying harder. Let's get back to that student. We went through this verse and I said, let's just pray as if this is actually true and see what happens. So I want you to give up you know, your, your filters on your computer, despair of all your self-help strategies, and we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to show up and kill for you a sin that clearly you can't kill yourself. Let me tell you this, when that student came back to my class the next week, I hardly recognized him. That cartoon cloud of guilt and shame that had been raining on him all semester was gone. He could look you square in the eye and you could see the real him beaming out of there. And all we did was prayed, Spirit, would you kill for him a sin he can't kill for himself? We prayed it day in, day out, week in, week out. And by the end of the semester, he had been pornography free. And it was beautiful. And, and the way he described it to me, he just nailed it. And he, and he got exactly to, he brought Romans 8 to life. He said, Thad, I'm just so filled up with the Holy Spirit that there's just no room left for the pornography. I just don't need, there's no space in my heart because I'm filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit. And so God doesn't just, when he kills us in, empty us so that we're starving for joy, starving for delight, starving for meaning. He fills us up with his spirit so we end up satisfied in the right thing. Think of it this way. Imagine yourself, uh, if you're a Christian and you're in this room, you are a walking civil war. And those of you who've been Christian long and have any measure of self-awareness, you know exactly what I'm talking about where you have the spirit, what Paul in Galatians 5, your spirit indwelt, but you are a walking war between spirit and what Paul calls flesh. To be a Christian is to be a walking civil war. Now picture yourself on that battlefield, spirit versus flesh, and by flesh, just for clarification, Paul doesn't mean your body, it doesn't mean your physical body's the, the enemy. Uh, in a biblical worldview, matter matters. Your body's important, it's good, it's blessed by God. It's called good in Genesis 1 and 2. He's talking instead about your selfish sin drives, your drive to make your three best friends, me, myself, and I, happy all the time. That's what Paul's talking about that's at war against the spirit inside of you. 
Now, picture yourself in that war, and here comes the flesh like a tank barreling towards you. It lowers its barrels. It has got you in its crosshairs, and it is trying to blast your joy in God to smithereens. You reach into your pocket. You pull out a straw and some spit wads. Are you going to win that war? Not a chance, right? And I did that for a long time. I had a strong spit wad approach to the flesh. I would just try harder. I would try some self-help strategy um, to break these downward spirals of guilt. But what Paul's getting at here in Romans 8, verse 13, by the Spirit, those three words, those ingredients that set a Christian worldview apart from every other system on the planet. What that means is you have a walkie-talkie in your hand, and you can radio in divine air support and watch the Holy Spirit fly over your life like a fleet of supernatural F-16s and drop his bombs of grace and blast those sin tanks to smithereens. You have that walkie-talkie in your hand. That's all I did with that student, was I said, throw your spit shooter on the ground. Get rid of your, your spit wads and your straws. Let's call in divine air support. And I can tell you from experience, having taught here for a long time, and seeing that same exact story I just told you about that student play out every single semester, one of the best parts of working here, one of the greatest joys in my job is seeing the Holy Spirit show up and break pornography addictions every semester. And that's not because of my teaching technique. It's not because of anything I'm bringing to the table. It is that the Holy Spirit loves when we throw our straws and spit wads on the ground. He loves when we walkie-talkie in his divine air support. He loves to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. So let me walk you through this uh, Step by step, and I want, I'm going to walk through the seven phases of sin killing here, how to get through these downward spirals of guilt. Um, and what we're really talking about here, by the way, if I could just add a word to, to some of your vocabularies, an old word, a forgotten word, um, mortification. It's, it's a word that pops up in Romans 8 in like the KJV, some of the old school V and now Bibles use the word mortification. But mortification uh, is the most important thing you could do today. It's the most important business of your, your daily life. And all it simply means is sin killing. Killing sin. I could, we could define it this way. Mortification is the spirit-powered process of killing all of our propensities for sinful, self-destructive pleasures that compete for superior pleasure in the all-satisfying God. Sin killing, destroying all of our destructive pleasures that compete for superior pleasure in the all-satisfying God. So what I want to do here for the next three minutes is I want to walk you through the steps of what mortification will actually look like in your life. And as I walk you through those seven steps, how to end up guilt-free by the time you get to step seven, I want you to put yourself into, the, into that continuum and see where you stand. Step one, or phase one. In this phase, my sin is no big deal. I'm not really at war against the, the flesh, or what Paul calls the, the sarks, my sin nature. Life by my flesh doesn't lead to death or rob me of superior pleasure in God. That's step one. Sin, no big deal. Then we move on to phase two. The flesh does lead to death. Enjoying God really is superior to sin's short-lived pleasures, and I need to do something about it. But the flesh is just a general faceless problem. I'm not sure what specific shapes it takes in my own life. So at phase two, you kind of get the idea of sin's a problem, but you haven't been able to pinpoint this is what that looks like in my life. Put it this way. In, in Galatians 5, when Paul is describing the civil war of the Christian life, he says, the deeds of the flesh are, and he gives a list. He says, dissension, drunkenness, debauchery, orgies, uh, sorcery. And, and, he, and he's giving this list, and he's not intending that as an exhaustive checklist of this is every way the flesh comes out. What he's doing is he's picking the things that were particular to first century Galatia. And, and what that tells us is that 
the flesh, your sin nature, will take different shape based off your own life and experience. If he was writing the book of Biolans instead of the book of Galatians, his list would probably look a lot different, right? I'm not sure sorcery is a huge issue on campus, right? Uh, but it was in first century Galatia. And, and so you need to realize the flesh isn't just some abstraction. It will take a particular destructive shape in your life based on your culture, based on your family, based on your upbringing, based on your traumas, based on your personal life experience. Uh, for example, uh, if you're raised in a home with a rageaholic for a parent, your flesh might take shape as rage more so than somebody who is raised in a mild-mannered home. Uh, if you were raised, uh, some of this can even be genetic. Uh, my grandparents, three out of four, died from booze. Three out of four of my grandparents. So alcoholism uh, would be in my bloodline. I would, there would be a strong genetic propensity there. By the grace and mercy of God, I'm not an alcoholic. Uh, but, but you see my point that the flesh isn't just some faceless generic problem. It will take a particular shape in your life based off your family, based off your culture, based off your own personal experiences and traumas. So at phase two that I'm describing here, you're not really sure what sin looks like. So you push on to, to phase three of mortification. Oh, those are the specific outward manifestations of the flesh in my life. I get it now. I see these are the specific sins I struggle with. So I'll focus on those behaviors, the gossip, the lying to paint myself in a better light, the pornography addiction or whatever. All I need is a few me-powered self-help measures to kill those specific sinful behaviors. That's phase three. If we push on to that, if you've tried, and that's honestly where a lot of you are, that's where I was for about five years, and when I was a Biola student, I was kind of stalled out in phase three. Uh, but eventually pushed on to phase four. In phase four, we say this. Wait a second, there's something way deeper going on here. My behavior correcting tactics are not actually killing my sin. These bad fruits must have bad roots. I can't change the bad fruits, the behaviors. I need to get to the root of those behaviors, which is my messed up heart. So I'll try that on my own, rather than letting others see the gnarly sin skeletons living in my heart's closet. So do you see this next phase? It's progress. You understand that behind your sinful behaviors, behind the bad fruits, underneath that on a deeper level, your heart, just like mine, is jacked up. Let me give uh, an illustration. A, good, a very good friend of mine here um, is the most busy person I've ever met in my life. His uh, to-do list is insane. And he came to me a little over a year ago and said, I'm just burnt out. I'm frying my brains. I have way too much going on. And so I encouraged him. I said, hey, why don't you try Sabbathing? You know that whole command in the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions, to rest one day out of a seven-day cycle? Why don't you just take God at his word and rest? And so I saw him the next week. I said, how'd it go? Did you take a day and just, just rest and, and worship? How'd that go for you? He said, I, I couldn't do it. I just I can't. And I said, all right, try it again. Just give it another shot. Trust me. Take God at his word. Rest, and it will do your soul good. Came back the next week. I just can't do it. And as we sat down and, and worked through the issues behind the issue, what it came down to was this. He felt like he had all these balls that he was juggling. I got school, I got my job, I got these relationships, I got all this stuff going on. He felt like if he just laid down for 24 hours, if he just rested, that all of his life, all those balls he was juggling would just come crashing down, just a big uh, catastrophic collapse of his entire life. And so I asked him, I said, you took my theology class. We talked about the sovereignty of God. Do you think God is sovereign enough for a 24 hour period, the God who sustains the entire cosmos, do you think he's big enough to keep the balls that you're juggling in your life in the air for those 24 hours? And he said, I don't think I really believe that. Do you see the issue behind the issue? There's the bad fruits. I'm way overcommitted. Underneath that, at the root level, 
There were doctrines that he would say with his mouth and his head would affirm, but hadn't made their way to his heart. And so I said, let's pray that the Holy Spirit helps your heart feel the reality of God's sovereignty so you can trust him for 24 hours in a seven day cycle that he can keep your life in the air. And when we got to the root of the issue, that's when the healing started to happen. That's when his, his sanity came back. Uh, so again, we need to go deeper than the fruits to the roots. Have you ever noticed, if you read one of the greatest confessions ever penned by a human being, Psalm 51, David has just had his sin with Bathsheba and murdering her husband Uriah, sending him to the front of the battlefield and lying about it. He's just had that sin exposed. One of the most fascinating things about Psalm 51 is that not even once in this great confession does David admit or own up to or name the fact that he slept with Bathsheba, killed her husband, and lied about it. He doesn't even get to the behaviors themselves. Why is that? He confesses on a much deeper level. He says, I was conceived in sin. Purify my heart. He's getting to the issue behind the issue, the, the deeper sin, the, the feelings that are all jacked up. So that's phase four. We realize that behind your bad sin behaviors, there's a jacked up heart. Phase five, okay. I get it. My isolated, solo, self-help efforts aren't really getting me anywhere. So I'll take the sin in my heart's closet, I'll take it out into the light of community. I'll, trust, I'll enlist trusted fellow Christians as allies in this battle. Maybe I'll join an accountability group. That should guarantee victory. This is a step that many of you take, and it's a good step in the sense that secret sin festers, secret sin has a way of, of growing and turning gnarly. Sin tends to die in the light when it's brought into community. And some of you are living in that little dark, closed off closet even this morning, and if that's the one thing you need to hear, to bust out of that closet and get it into the light. Find some trusted people that you can kind of barf all those issues on. Uh, that's phase five. But for those of you who have done phase five, you know that an accountability group doesn't really kill your sin. Sometimes what accountability groups turn into is like, so are you still struggling with it? Yep, how about you? Yep, bummer, see you next week. That's kind of the way they go. And so while phase five is a good thing, because now more people are in on it, you've enlisted some allies in your internal civil war, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition for killing sin. Which pushes us to phase six. Knowing that I'm at war against forces that destroy my joy in God, Knowing what the specific tanks are in my life, those specific sin tanks that are trying to blast my joy in God to smithereens, knowing that those tanks are not outward behaviors as much as they're in my heart, knowing that all my little spit shooter self-help techniques are no match for this internal enemy, inviting others to help me wage that war, check, 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 and check. You've done all those things. But I still haven't made my sin die. I must need supernatural sin-killing power here. So I will pray persistently, calling in the divine air support of the Holy Spirit, like that supernatural F-16, to blast these internal evils to bits. And I'm gonna get my fellow Christian allies to pray the same. That's phase six. That's where a lot of us need to get to this morning. And it leads to phase seven. In phase seven, I've been prayerfully relying on God's power, I've been relying on the power of Christ's cross, the power of the omnipotent spirit as I strive to kill sin, and sin is actually being killed. Not yea me, but all praise and thanks to the sovereign God who changed my heart. Do you see that if you could kill sin by your own power, by your own cleverness, by your own self-help strategies, if you actually succeeded in killing sin that way, you could give yourself a big pat on the back. Because we break out of these downward spirals of guilt and shame, because we kill sin in and by the Spirit, He gets all the credit, He gets all the glory when that tank is blasted to bits. 
So wherever you are in this seven-phase cycle, I encourage you this morning to move ahead. Because John Owen, the great Puritan, uh, reminds us in his classic work, The Mortification of Sin. He says, kill sin or sin will be killing you. So don't let your sin drop bombs on your joy in God without relentlessly blasting back in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Let me read uh, the words of Owen. How many of you guys have read John Owen before? Just curious by a show of hands. Just a very small handful of us. Um, he is awesome. And not only is he a brilliant Puritan theologian, he had one of the most awe-inspiring perms out of all the Puritans. Uh, if you look at pictures of the guy, he just had these glorious flowing locks. Um, so, so John Owen, he understood uh, sin killing. His little book, Mortification of Sin, um, just gets to the heart of the issue. Listen to his words. He says, the vigor, the power, the comfort of your spiritual life depends on the mortification of the deeds of the flesh. All other ways of mortification are vain. It must be done by the Spirit. You hear how he's, he's quoting Paul, Romans 8, 13. It must be done by the Spirit. Mortification from a self-strength, carried on by ways of self-invention, unto an end of self-righteousness, that's the soul and substance of all false religion in the world. A man, says Owen, can easier see without eyes, speak without a tongue, than truly mortify one sin without the Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right, so here's how we're going to close. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, in his tome, uh, The Abolition of Man, talks about the problem of our generation as we have lost the concept of what he calls just sentiments. By just sentiments, he's describing feelings that do justice to the object felt. He means that your feelings correspond to reality. That's a just sentiment in Lewis's worldview. What Lewis calls just sentiment, feelings that fit reality, Paul calls the fruits of the spirit. Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit are, help me out, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, right? Th those are the just sentiments. Behind our sin behaviors, we all in this room, myself included, have unjust sentiments. You can't fix your own broken heart. You can't recalibrate it so that Sin tastes as disgusting as it actually is to you, and Jesus tastes as sweet to you as he actually is. You need the Holy Spirit to recalibrate the taste buds of your soul and infuse into you just sentiments so that your feelings correspond to the glory, the splendor, how satisfying Jesus really is. You need the Holy Spirit to recalibrate. I need the Holy Spirit to recalibrate my heart so that sin tastes to us as disgusting, as unfulfilling as it really is. And so we're going to do that together right now. Uh, I'm going to, to wrap us up in a prayer. And I'm going to leave about 40 seconds to 60 seconds uh, for you to do some mortification. For you to take Paul's words in Romans 8, 13, that it's by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the flesh. To do what Paul's talking about in Galatians 5, waging this civil war by the power of the Spirit, so that the Spirit can produce in us the just sentiments that we need to kill sin and break out of these downward spirals of guilt and shame. So in that 40 seconds to 60 seconds, I want you guys to just uh, be honest with God and ask the Holy Spirit to kill sin in you that you can't kill for yourself. Now, one quick thought, and then I'll pray, and we'll call it a day. In the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, Paul is writing to a church that struggled with, the Greek word is porneia, sexual immorality. 
Now, Paul does not write to them and say, look, Thessalonians, get your act together. Get some filters for your internet. Go ahead and start an accountability group. Just try harder. Come up with some other self-help strategy. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, he says a prayer for them that's beautiful. He says, may God cause you to increase and abound in love. Do you see how he's just applying exactly what he was saying in Romans 8.13, that it's by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh. Now, by the time you get to his second letter to the Thessalonians, he uses the exact same language in the first chapter to say, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because you are, same language, increasing and abounding in love. Do you connect the dots? When we ask those prayers, those empty-handed prayers, rather than trying to dazzle God with how hard we've been trying, those empty hands that say, I can't kill it, Spirit, kill it for me. That way God gets all the glory. Let's pray together. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.